Uh, salute, Jack Brussels, uh, Jean-Mapé Mateus, and that's all the French I got for today. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, we're here to talk about deep diving on concurrent React. And I know we saw like different talks about concurrent React and about parallelism and etc. cetera. Uh, this is gonna be kind of a complimentary take on that. Uh, this is me, Mateus Albuquerque. I'm doing front end at Medallia. I'm also mentoring front end at Tech Labs and NGO, and you can find me everywhere as Y Decaminator. And by the way, on this QR code, you can find all the links for slides and uh, etc. I do have a disclaimer. So this talk is supposed to be a deep dive. So in some contents, uh, where they feel like they really need more discussions, uh, you're gonna find this emoji. So this means after conf or coffee break, so whatever, it, need, it means more discussions. And this one conference is really, really special for me. Ever since I heard it was, this is gonna happen, I was really looking forward because it was my chance to visit the, the store of Tantan. I'm a huge fan, so I'm really glad to be here. Okay, let's go to business. Uh, and um, a little bit of context on the whys of the session and et cetera. So why do we even bother discussing concurrent React? I think that if we were to think of one word for that, it would be performance. Performance. And uh, we usually hear concurrent React and think in terms of runtime responsiveness or even smoothness, like improving our transitions and animations and stuff. But today I want to discuss actually not only these two, but also perceived load speed and load responsiveness of our apps, uh, all with concurrent React. So starting with the basics and uh, like classic examples. So here, for example, I have uh, a few input fields, I have links, I have buttons and uh, all of these, they stop working when I block the main thread. As you saw, like blocking the main thread is a complicated thing and we want to avoid that, right, Nyoko? And this happens because of those things that are the long tasks that when we are using the developer tools, we always see them with those red flags. And I know that this one example, it was like created and etc. but long tasks, they are out there in a lot of apps, and uh, actually there are a reason why we have user behavior like rage clicking, that is what you see when the, the UI is not responsive and you start clicking multiple times. And not only they are an actual thing, but uh, we even have metrics for that, like first input delay or time to interactive and others. And we get a better picture of that when we start seeing some research around these. For example, this one that is basically showing that on mobile devices, the long task we have is even it's seven times worse. And it doesn't stop there. Actually, they not only delay the first input, they not only cause first input delay, but they also delay the time to interactive. And on mobile, you can get to 12 times longer long tasks. And there's even a thing that is on older devices, half of their load time could be spent on long tasks. And it's bad if we see like that, but when we put this on a chart and correlate with the business metrics like conversion rate, it is even worse. So that's why we bother discussing concurrent React. And to move forward, I do have one exercise, like a mental exercise for us all. Like if you were to summarize concurrent React in one word or expression, what you would go with. For example, if I had to talk about fibers in one expression, I would talk then about units of work. So I really wanna hear from you. So just this QR code, and it's gonna be for a few seconds. So if you could help me giving your impressions about concurrent React, um, by the way, uh, there's going to be some swag and stickers and got that kind of thing for whoever participates. But, and that's always tricky because 40 seconds doesn't sound like a lot of time, but when you have to keep a conversation going, <laughs> it is a lot of time. <laughs> but, but yeah, uh, 10 seconds to go. Let me know what your thoughts about Concurrent React, how you would summarize that, and then we can move forward. Okay, cool. 
So taking one step back and talking about the main thread. So what we know that long tasks, they are bad because uh, they not only take long, but they also block other tasks. And we can think of long tasks that are as something that takes more than 50 milliseconds. And actually, this number is not a magic number. It's based on a user-centric model called Rail. I would definitely recommend you to check ab more about that. And then we get to the question that we've been hearing throughout the whole day. How do we avoid blocking the main thread? And for that, we have different strategies. And it's easier when we can visualize them. So let's say we have four tasks, A, B, C, and D. Uh, we can go with parallelism and split them in different CPU cores. We can also go with concurrency, where we have one single core, but uh, we quickly switch between them, giving the impression of concurrency. And then we get to scheduling. That is basically when we have concurrency, but we have a piece of software called scheduler that assigns different priorities to different tasks using some kind of heuristics. So let's quickly recap parallelism just for the sake of making a point here. So we already know that they, it works via message passing. Like in the browser, we have works, workers, and they work via message passing. And we know the gotchas. We don't have access to variables or code because of the limitations. And because of that, we don't have access to the DON either. And it's interesting because we have actually two mental models to work with workers uh, on a browser. And they are actors and shared memory. So quickly going through them, uh, in the actor model, you probably heard about that in languages or ecosystems like Elixir. Or if you are a backender, you probably heard about that. So we have this abstraction called an actor. And basically, it fully owns the data it is operating on. And everything goes via message passing. So an actor can only send and receive messages. And if we were to think about actors in the browser, the main thread we have is like the actor that owns the DOM and the UI. And the gotchas here is that because we are using workers, we have to go with post message. And post message is a fire and forget mechanism. So there is no built-in idea of tracking request and response. And we end up having to balance, uh, OK, we are moving code to a worker to offload the main thread and be faster. But at the same time, there's the communication overhead caused by the fact that we are copying things. And last but not least, we would also have to handle whether that work is busy processing something else or not. An alternative for that is the shared memory model. And uh, in the browser, we have one data type for that. That is the shared array buffer. And the good thing is that if we send a shared array buffer via post message, on the other end, you're going to get a handle to the exact same chunk of memory. So this is good. Um, but the thing is, in the browser and like in the web, uh, most of the APIs we have, they were, they were not built with the idea of concurrent access to an, an object at the same time. So because of that, we end up having to create our own data structures to handle that, like mutexes or other stuff from parallelism that we would have in other languages. And the last uh, gotcha is that there is no direct uh, way of using arrays or objects or the traditional things in JavaScript we are used to. We're just handling a series of bytes. Uh, I cannot not mention WASM. So I have to say that WASM is probably the best experience for the shared memory model. But first, it doesn't offer the comfort of JavaScript that we have. And the second thing is that WebAssembly is really fast when you stay within WebAssembly. But the more you have to cross the line and do DOM stuff, DOM manipulations, access UI, and that kind of stuff, it gets slower. And actually, there are some benchmarks showing that uh, regular UI frameworks like React or the others we are used to, they can be more performant than the fastest low level implementations of WASM at doing DOM stuff. And before we move forward, there's some amazing stuff out there for doing workers. Uh, we have the Atomics uh, data type that is uh, a spec that is being built. And we have libraries like Conlink and WorkerDon and much more. So there's amazing stuff out there. 
But we can kind of get to the conclusion that workers, and uh, we saw that before, that workers are amazing for data processing and when you got to crunch numbers and that kind of stuff, but they tend to be hard to use for UI related stuff. And sometimes they're harder than, for example, adjusting the work you got to do for a scheduler. And that's when we get to the second part that is concurrency and scheduling. So back to the question I asked before, uh, I really hope this is gonna work because it's live stuff, but I don't know. It did, <laughs> I'm so happy. Do I have to drink water? <laughs> so uh, I see that most of you um, went with blocking and then secondly, tasks and parallelism. So I wanna show you my take on that. If I had to go with one word, that word would be scheduling. And that leads us to talking about scheduling in React. So yeah, there's no workers, there's no WASM, there's no parallelism at all. What we have though is a cooperative multitasking model where we have a single thread, but it's interruptible. And because it's interruptible, uh, the, the rendering process can be interleaved with other tasks in the main thread. And these other tasks can be other React renders. And also because of that, an update can happen, for example, user input or that kind of thing can happen uh, in the background without blocking a uh, response to new input. And it's easier if we can visualize. So it's basically like this. Uh, let's say React is rendering something and I start typing into an input field. Uh, it's gonna do this high priority render task to respond to my input, but as soon as I'm done, it's going to resume the original render tasks and that's mostly because it, ha it can track word using fibers. And another really interesting thing is the heuristics. Uh, so basically React uses the execution back to the main thread every five milliseconds and it's not a magic number, <laughs> just like the ones we have in CSS. Uh, that's basically because it's smaller than a single frame even on 120 FPS devices. So that's what makes that in practice rendering is interruptible. And alongside heuristics, another really interesting thing that we have are the priority levels. So we see them in the source of the scheduler package inside React, and we're gonna see them throughout the whole framework. So we're gonna see them inside the reconciler, uh, inside the renderers like React DOM, and also inside DevTools like React DevTools. And these uh, range from uh, immediate to idle, and each of them have a different uh, timeout assigned, and basically they tell when React is gonna do some task, um, for example, whether it has to happen now or whether it can be delayed in some sense or that kind of thing. And the last uh, amazing thing are the render lanes. So basically render lanes are an abstraction built around bit masks. So one lane equals to one bit in a bit mask. And it's really amazing because each updating React is assigned to one lane. And because of that, you can batch render, you can batch updates in different lanes or together or whatever. And this also gives you a lot of granularity. So you have 31 levels because that's how much you can fit in a bit mask. And the great thing about that is that it allows React uh, underneath to choose whether to render multiple transitions and we saw transitions in a single batch or render them separate in a separate way. And this is also great because it reduces overhead in the browser. So for example, it reduces layout passes, style recalculations and uh, multiple paints. So that's another amazing way to, to optimize stuff. And I myself, when I went through these concepts like the heuristic things, the render lanes and etc. that was like really mind blowing for me. Uh, but at the same time, I couldn't stop remembering this talk by Kites that's called, but you're not Facebook. So I was like, yeah, I'm, we're, most of us are not building schedulers. Most of us are not even building libraries that are going to communicate with the core of React. So how can we benefit from these in our everyday projects? And this takes us to the next session that is scheduling React for the rest of us. <laughs> so I've gathered four different scenarios. Uh, 
where I think we can use the amazing stuff, the amazing concurrent React features, and uh, with sometimes with hooks, sometimes with hydration, transitions, and etc. And the first one is when we have to handle a lot of data. So we usually see a lot of non-practical examples of rendering, of handling a lot of data. So heavy stuff like finding primes or running complex algorithms to crack passwords, that kind of thing we're not doing on a daily basis, right? Or even rendering the Sierpinski triangle. They're great for benchmarking, but on a daily basis, we're, for example, building dashboards, we are rendering charts with a lot of data points, we are rendering on a canvas and that we don't have a screen canvas or we are processing data. So let's get this one example. Uh, it's basically rendering uh, the amount of visitors uh, per day and I'm filtering the data using this um, data selector. And you can see that the animation is a bit laggy, especially when I select a huge frame because it's a lot of data. And the code for that, uh, it's really simple. We have one effect, we have a uh, user state, and uh, then we have a no change handler. And we can just change that to use a transition from React, like the ones we saw with Tejas. And uh, then it's way, way smoother and way, way faster. And I myself, when I saw transitions, I, I, I was really, I wish I could go back in time to some apps I worked in, in the past. And now I had this scenario, for example, I was building this map and we had more than 1,100 uh, data points plotted on the map. And uh, back then we used workers, uh, we used some Redux Saga utilities and we even debounced the stuff. But actually if we had transition, that would have been better. And another example is like, this was like three years ago, uh, we were building a real time game and there was an admin panel and people were, it was a football game and the, there was like a thousand play, thousands of players and they were sending thousands of messages and an admin would have been able to search and filter that data. And back then we did a lot of list virtualization in the chat and uh, we overused memoization a lot just to make things performant. But again, if we had transitions that would have been way better. So that's one scenario. The second scenario is tackling wasted renders. So we usually think about uh, use memo, use callback, or for example, memoizing the component or not passing one or another props when we talk about wasted renders, how can we prevent them? But we have another ally. So who's seen this hook, use sync external store? Okay, Phil. So it's really simple, actually. It has the subscribe function and you have two functions for getting snapshots. And the thing is, this hook was really marketed out there as a hook for library maintainers. And uh, actually some libraries are now using it, like Redux or Voltio, they are using that uh, under the hood. But again, how we are not building Redux, how can we benefit from that? One thing we, are probably using is React Router, right? Who's using React Router? Okay, quite a few. So you probably know uh, that we have the use location hook and that it gives us a lot of information about th the route. So we have, for example, the path name, the hash and etc. But it's what we can call an over returning hook because even though we just want the path name, it's gonna give us the hash anyways and other information. And the result of that is that uh, we have uh, a component and you can see that as I change the hash, the path name is also re-rendering, even though it doesn't change. I still have the, path, the same path name and the, it's re-rendering with no change. We could get this code and replace use location with one hook we're gonna create called use history selector. And inside use history selector, I'm using use history from React Router and use sync external store that we just saw. And with that, I can create a selector for the path name and another for the hash. And the result is uh, as I change the hash, it's the only component that re-renders. So the path name doesn't re-render anymore. And that's huge. <laughs> uh, 
Okay. <laughs> Another part I do love is hydration. So there's a lot of, there, there have been many improvements when it comes to hydration. And especially before, um, when we were doing SSR and et cetera, hydration could only begin after the entire data was fetched and rendered. And the thing is, the users of the app, they couldn't interact until the whole page was hydrated. And the result is, if you had some parts of that page that were faster, they ended up waiting for the slower parts. And that's like kind of pity. Uh, with React 18 and Concurrent React and et cetera, we've got selective hydration. So now React doesn't wait anymore for a component to load so that it continues streaming the, rest, the HTML for the rest of the page. And also using schedulers and et cetera, React is going to prioritize hydrating uh, the parts that the users are interacting, at the, they interact first. So it's basically going to hydrate first what's more important. And another thing also thanks to scheduling and concurrency stuff is that uh, the browser can do other work at the same time as hydration. And this results in better FID and better INP. By the way, INP is another metric that people are working on to be kind of a replacer to first input delay. It's called interaction to next paint. And doing that is as easy as dropping things with suspense. And actually, there are some cases out there. For example, Versal, they managed to improve uh, their website for next by using that. The last one is the profiler, because not only we want to build apps, we also want to be able to profile them. So we have this new scheduling tab in the profiler that basically allows us to inspect our transitions, uh, which is really good. And it gives us really interesting hints. So for example, if it detects there is a long task that could be potentially turned into a transition, and it's going to tell you, hey, you could be doing that inside the transition, and that would make things faster. Another thing that uh, we usually don't talk a lot when we're discussing concurrent React is measure. So if we're doing things for performance, it's important that we measure things. And uh, it's always important to remember that we do have, right now, a lot of interesting tools for measuring things in the lab. So we have the profiler API, we have open source stuff like why did you handle, and we have Lighthouse and many other tools. And we should also prof uh, measure things in the field as users are using the app. So we have uh, Web Vitals uh, is open source, and we have observability services like Calibre, and even Versal, they got like built-in user analytics. And we also have the web. So the web is evolving more and more in give us, giving us a lot of APIs like timing APIs and even profiling APIs. And when, for example, we look at uh, what we can figure out about our apps just using, for example, the profiling APIs, it's a lot of information. So yeah, we should use observability services and libraries like Web Vitals, but it's also important that we can use the web and React to build our own abstractions or own hooks to measure stuff. Uh, one of the last things is the future. So all of the things I mentioned, um, they really, really pumped me up about React, but there's amazing stuff coming down the line. So uh, we're going to have I.O. libraries like React Fetch. I know the promise has been there for a while now. Uh, we're going to be, we're going to have built-in support for people building I.O. libraries with uh, the cache component. We're going to have suspense for CPU bound trees, which by the way is one of my favorite things. So just like we do suspense for data fetching, we're going to be able to, sus to stop rendering before React even tries to render, if we know that a certain subtree of our app is going to do something that is CPU bound. We're going to have more hooks for library maintainers, like using search and fact. Uh, we're going to have the off-screen component that is an amazing way to assign like idle priority uh, to our components, just wrapping them with that. And server components, which could be a whole other talk. And we're going to have native scheduling primitives in the browser. So Who's familiar with the scheduling API in the browser? Cool. So yeah, we do have some scheduling primitives and et cetera, but uh, the web lacks a unified way 
to, for doing things other than, for example, requesting idle callback or setting timeouts and that kind of thing. So we're going to have an API that is promise-based and allows you to, that is directly integrated into the event loop. And uh, it's really aligned with the work of the React core team and et cetera. And it brings a lot of utilities for handling with tasks, for yielding executions of things to the event loop, for waiting for the conditions, and uh, even detecting if the browser is busy handling some kind of input. I would definitely recommend you to check out this pack. And by the way, there are even people using it. So Facebook, for example, uh, is already using some parts of the API. Airbnb, and there are even open source libraries inspired by the specs of that API. Some closing notes. Oof. I was thirsty. <laughs> so I love this tweet by Guillermo, uh, the CEO of Verso or Zeit back then. Uh, in 2016, he said that React is such a good idea that we would spend the rest of the decade exploring implications and applications. And I think, for example, that this amazing scheduler API that is being uh, prepared in the browser is one of the signs that actually React has been pushing web APIs to the future, and not only web APIs, but even other ecosystems. Uh, another thing is that actually understanding, even though uh, in the first point it sounds like really mind-blowing, the things with lanes and uh, the different priorities and the internals of the scheduler, they sound like a lot of stuff, but I, I really think that understanding then helps us building our own abstractions and our own solutions within React. Uh, it's always important to remember that scheduling uh, doesn't by definition, mean better performance. Just like anything else, it's got uh, its gotchas, and scheduling can actually cause overhead in the app. So, which, by the way, could be a whole other session. So, it's always the cliche is always true. Like, there's no silver bullet, and because of that, it's always important that we identify the core met metrics of our app, regardless if we're going with Quick, Astro, Concurrent React whatever thing in React, workers, etc. Another thing is there's a lot of information out there. So we're going to see uh, core committers, creators of different tools saying a lot of different things and making really good points about all of these tools. So because of that, it is important that we always try to correlate uh, the performance of our apps with business metrics like uh, conversion rates, as we saw in the beginning, and that kind of stuff, because these metrics are what most matter in the end. Another closing note is that we are hiding <laughs> uh, at Medalia, so if you want to work with uh, performance in real huge apps, reach out. Um, the slides for this session are going to be are available already on my speaker deck profile. And probably the most important part is that I have stickers. So that's the key takeaway of the session. So if you want to uh, reach out for stickers and et cetera, I'll be around. And thank you so much for having me. I think we should have time for a few <coughs> questions.